Right, so does that work pretty well, microphone-wise? So yeah, thanks Jonathan. Um, sandwiched after you know, that extremely boring talk about really low-scale problems and you know, coming between that and beer. So I'll try and keep you entertained. Um, so my name is Simon Rakiff. I work for a project called the Square Kilometre Ray South Africa. And basically our enviable task is to construct the largest scientific facility in the Southern Hemisphere, the world's largest radio telescope, um, a budget of somewhere in the region of three million euro by the time it's finished. And uh, we have quite a lot of problems of scale, as you can imagine. And uh, I'll sort of take us on a bit of a ramble journey through a bit of astronomy and then how we're addressing our challenges. Uh, a bit of a punt for Python, of course, because any time I stand up and talk, I'll have to punt Python. So those of you who don't like Python, please fall asleep and then I'll wake you up again when it's appropriate. But first of all, what is SKA anyway? So what is this thing that we talk about? What is this, this, this big beast? So to start off, of course, in the beginning, right in the beginning, there were quantum fluctuations, which is basically science to speak for. We have no idea what was going on there, but something happened. And <laughs> we went from quantum fluctuations through a period of inflation. Everything was very hot and very dense, and then it all cooled down again. We had the dark ages, so we've got lots of lovely terms that we can use. And as we progressed through the evolution of the universe, we kind of ended up round about here where we are now. So kind of there's blue green algae, there's the dinosaurs, there's us. So you know, this is quite a big scale that we're talking about. Um, human history doesn't really impinge upon this much, except you know now we're building satellites and sending our information out into the void. But I thought it was kind of interesting to to think about you know the, the sort of recent history and um, basically a bit of survival. So you know one of the things we had to do as living creatures was avoid trouble. So you know there are volcanoes, there are men covered in grapes, snakes, sharktopus, you know, <laughs> saber tooth. These are all the challenges facing you know sort of. Neolithic man as he emerges from his, uh, his primitive life. And one of the best survival tools we had at our disposal was, of course, our eyesight, the eye. So this is a, a beautiful picture of how evolution actually works. You start with some sort of like silicon photodiode here, and you end up with like a fishbowl with like, you know, a hat on or something. So you know, I think the ID crowd love this kind of diagram. But it still gives you the, you know, the point across, is that the development of eyesight and the ability to recognize your surroundings and the ability to understand what your environment was going to do to you because something was about to leap at you and kill you was very important. And the scale of the eye is quite an interesting thing. You know, the scale of the eye is basically related to the, the wavelength that we, we see in. So the visible light that comes from the sun, that's where the sun is maximally radiant um, in, you know, in, in the, the visible spectrum. And the resolution that is useful in the eye go hand in hand to give you this kind of like you know, a couple of centimeter sized eyeball which lets you see 10 centimeters at a distance of a kilometer which is pretty much what you want to do if you know, things are rustling in the bush over there, you want to be able to see what's happening. So it's kind of quite fortunate that these things you know, all came together. But eventually what happened was, you know, the, we moved away from the volcanoes and we killed the saber tooths and Shocktopus got bad reviews, so it was cancelled. So things got a lot easier. <laughs> then we had some kind of leisure time. We could uh, you know, sit down and look up the sky and contemplate what it was all about. And it was really the Babylonians who first sort of thought about, well, there's some patterns up there. You know, there are a whole lot of things that don't really seem to move relative to each other. Those are basically the stars, the things that seem to wander through the heavens, those are the planets. And if you spend enough time making enough you know, annotations on your, you know, your clay tablet, eventually, if it doesn't break, you come back the next year and you find that, wait, things are happening in the same way. And so they were the first, really, to be able to understand what astronomy could offer you in terms of understanding the seasons, understanding when to plant crops, and really using it as a useful scientific tool. Nowadays, if you were to go out into the Karoo, which is where we've built this thing called Cat7, and you could switch off the sky, this is basically what you would see. Uh, with your naked eye, uh, if you sit there at night in the crew, far away from any kind of light pollution or anything you can see, and look up at the heavens, you can kind of see 20,000 stars or so with the naked eye. That's a magnitude of eight plus, plus eight. Um, but of course, we're seeing 20,000 stars out of our galaxy. How many stars in our galaxy? Anyone? Anyone? Lots? <laughs> lots and lots? Maybe about 300 billion stars in our galaxy. So you can see 20,000. When you stand there on the darkest night you can find, you know, you're in the middle of the Arctic somewhere, you look up, your eye can see roughly 20,000 distinct stars out of the 400 billion in our galaxy. Our galaxy, of course, is, is you know, pretty small and average, and there may be 500 billion other galaxies out there. So you know, that's, a scale, that's a scale problem in itself, and a challenge to try and kind of understand all this. But of course, when you can only see 20,000 of these with your naked eye, it doesn't really help you to understand what actually is going on. So we needed better instruments than our eye, which was good in running away from cyber <coughs> tigers, but it wasn't great for doing other things. 
So on the scene comes Galileo. He didn't invent the telescope. He stole the idea from a Dutchman. He ran back to Venice. He built a prototype in three days. He ran off to the Doge of Venice and says, ha, I've invented this telescope. And he said, that's wonderful. And he gave him, doubled his money and he gave him tenure for life. Of course, Galileo went on to discover the moons of Jupiter and a whole lot of other discoveries, so it was well worth it. But principally, he used other people's ideas and he was quite a showman. So he was kind of the Steve Jobs of his era, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Steve. And this really started a bit of a craze. So this, this guy, Johannes Sibelius, he's kind of my, one of my favorite early astronomers because he was completely mad, of course. And he just built bigger and bigger long tubes to build these big refracting telescopes. Um, this was his 60-foot one, which he used quite often. He built a 120-foot one, but it broke in half the first night. So he kind of decided, well, you know, this is where I should stop. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, just the observing regalia that you used to use at the time was awesome. So we should probably go back to this. You know, there's something about the pomp and ceremony of uh, sitting down, you know, fully costumed for your night of observing that's, uh, that's very attractive to me. <laughs> but so optical astronomy has, has a long history, you know, from sort of 1600s. And uh, where we are now is basically this is... You know, pretty much cutting edge. This is only a 2.2 meter telescope. Uh, we have 10 meter telescopes, but it's indicative of what we see. And what we're seeing here is our nearest galaxy, Centaurus. Well, it's not truly our nearest galaxy, but it's Centaurus A. It's a nearby galaxy. It's itself a couple of hundred billion stars. Um, it's pretty close to us. You know, we're only talking the vicinity of 10 million light years. So you know, just a drop in the ocean, just next door, really. And you look at that and you think, wow, that's amazing. You know, you can really see everything that's cooking in that galaxy. But can you? And that's the question. Because what are we looking at? When we're looking in at visible light, we're really just seeing a small fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum. So I mean, over here, you've got sinister Google projects. Over here are those mind control rays controlling Steve Barmer. There's a whole lot of good stuff in between. And when you look with an optical telescope, you see this little segment here. And you could assume, you could say, well, this is, must be the same as everything else out here. It must all look the same. But you find out, of course, that it doesn't. So if you start observing in other wavelengths, with other frequencies, what you see is this. So you go back and you look at the same thing, and you take this modest 2.2 meter telescope, and you add data from currently the world's largest radio telescope, and you see, actually, hello, well, there's that thing in the middle, which I saw with the optical telescope, but here are these big jets of gas. Now, you know, these jets of gas are a million light years in extent. You know, they're the same size as the galaxy. So this whole massive amount of stuff we just didn't see at all until we started looking in the, in the radio regime. And that's what's you know, kind of really exciting about radio astronomy is it lets you see something completely new, it lets you look at things that you didn't see before. And if you zoom out a bit further, so there's that central thing we saw, there's some blobs. It's blobby because we made this with a small crappy telescope we have, not the big one in America, but our big one that we're building will be better than that one, so it all works out in the end. And you look and see, well, there's that little middle piece, and actually, this thing is actually huge. So there's, there's radio emission, which spans about nine degrees. So if you go into the night sky and you hold up your thumb, that's kind of like half a degree. The moon is half a degree. So this thing is nine degrees in extent on the sky. If you could see it with your eyes, your eyes would be two meters in diameter, but you'd be able to see this like, epic, massive galaxy um, in the night sky. So it, again, it's a bit about you know, what we're actually missing. So those who've been paying attention will realize that we had a relatively modest optical telescope with currently the world's largest radio telescope combined. And the reason for that are energy concerns. So to melt a snowflake is about a joule of energy. Kinetic energy of a mosquito, well, that's not too bad. You know, we're talking microjoules. This is how much energy the largest radio telescope in the world receives per day from what it's observing in the sky. Okay? A tenth of a picajoule. So that's slightly problematic because it's not really that very much, you know, to work with. If you come and, you know, turn on your toaster over here, you're creating more energy that's going into this thing that's coming from the sky by a long way. So, you know, we need to build these things pretty big. So this is where the scale comes into it. So what do we do first? Of course, we scale up and we build bigger and bigger dishes. So this is the first radio dish that was built by Grote Riba in his backyard. Another Dutchman, they're very pioneering, these guys, especially building things in the backyard. I don't know if his wife was too pleased about this because there was a washing line. There's a great photo that shows him demolishing the washing line. <laughs> the radio telescope. And... Uh, so, you know, that's kind of fairly modest, nine meters. Uh, Bernard Lovell comes along in the UK, builds a dish, 76 meters. Uh, Effelsberg in Germany, 100 meters. And when you start building these dishes this big on individual scale, your mechanical engineers come to you very nervously and they think this, something is going to go wrong. Because not only is these things costing a lot of money, but to engineer them well 
is taking a lot of effort. So this is the Green Bank Telescope, and you note I'll say it's the old Green Bank Telescope um, in, in the US. This was a 100 meter diameter telescope, and it was one of the biggest uh, of its kind. One morning, someone rolled up, and that had happened to it. <laughs> so <laughs> that's when scale up goes, gets to the end. We built the biggest server we can, and now it's exploded, so now we need to do something else. So of course, what we do is we scale out. So instead of building one big, giant, huge radio telescope, we build lots and lots of little small ones, and we glue them together with computers. And the nice thing about that is it means that you know, the mechanical engineers can get on with designing these, and we can just everything else becomes a software problem. And software is very easy to solve, as everyone around here knows. So it doesn't take any money or any people, and it just gets left for last. <laughs> this is not Photoshop. It's actually real. This is our site in the Karoo. Um, so this is we've, uh, we've built our first prototype, if you like. These are seven antennas. Um, it's uh, a site 200 kilometers north of Sutherland. It's about eight hours drive from here. Uh, if you were to get out there, there was nothing there when we started. There's still not much there except for these dishes. Uh, you, I don't know if you can see any sheep in this photo, but basically we're the only shade around for about 60 kilometers. So whenever it's a hot day, there's sheep, and any tourists that come, they flock underneath our dishes, and then we crush their cars with our antennas when they park <laughs> there, which is quite good. So that's a small telescope. We're building, currently, we're breaking ground on what we call a medium telescope. So this is known as Meerkat. So the previous one was the Karoo Ray Telescope, or CAT, and this one is Meerkat, so Afrikaans, more, and you know, we can have a nice furry animal as our mascot, which is great as well. And um, we're building 64 dishes. So we had seven, now we're building 64. It's pretty modest, 64, but when, when this is, once this is complete, this will be the largest radio telescope in the world, basically, at this frequency. So it's medium, but it's still pretty big. What we're really getting to is this thing, which is the square kilometer array, which instead of 64 is 2,500 of these antennas. 2,200 of them in, in the Karoo, and the rest of them scattered throughout Africa, as far afield as Mauritius and Madagascar. So that's what we call a big telescope. And you know, we're talking an, an improvement in sensitivity of, of 100 fold. So we've got to go out two orders of magnitude from roughly what we currently can handle. And um, why do we build these things? So what we want to do is we want to do science, ultimately. Uh, this is what I would, you know, this is small science because we did it with our small telescope. This is CAT7. And uh, what you see here, this is uh, an image the Australians made. And so we needed to make one to correspond. Of course, they only can do black and white because they're living in 1950. But, um, <laughs> sorry, poor Australians. But no, um, it was a good comparison. They'd observed this a long time ago. We built a telescope to see if we could observe it as well uh, as part of our, our trial. And what's interesting here is the galaxy is there in the middle there. So there's your 100 billion stars. All this is jets of matter coming out of that galaxy. And the reason it's bent is because this thing is actually hurtling at about a third of the speed of light up that way. And this stuff's being bent around. And you know, that's you know, 10 million light years across or something. So you know, it's, 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 it's quite big. It's 250 million light years away as well, um, which is hard to really figure out what light year is. But it's, it's far away. So more science. This is what we want to get to, big science. So we're doing small science now, we're going to big science. And big science is fundamental questions about our universe. So we want to understand how did it form? How did it get to where it is now? How did we get galaxies and the structure we see in the universe? Because it's, you know, at the moment, it's very, uh, you know, it's very heterogeneous. There's over densities. There's all these galaxies sitting there. And there's lots of big empty space and clouds of gas. And how did it all really come, out, come about and come to be? So those are sort of cosmological questions. We want to understand things like magnetism on a grand scale. We know how it works kind of in the lab. We don't really know how it works on a gal galactic scale. Uh, we want to understand how does, you know, how do the laws of physics handle themselves in the most extreme circumstances? And you know, the things we're building are going to give us these tools. We can also look for extraterrestrial intelligence. So SETI is a, a part that we're not allowed to talk about because people get nervous when we mention SETI and then the funding disappears. So we'll do it anyway, but you don't tell people that you're going to do so. Because you know, it's just uh, maybe you know, 10 years' time, I think the pendulum will swing in. We can talk about it again. But at the moment, it's very no one wants to talk about SETI. So what do we need to do with all this stuff? So these telescopes are great, but they produce lots and lots of data. So Meerkat is kind of medium data. This is, you know, it's not much. It's uh, a petabyte a day uh, is what we'll produce with Meerkat. And you know, to visualize this, basically, you know, if every teenager on the planet has an eye device, and you take it, and you blend it up, and each grain of eye device and detritus you tag with a byte of data, that then is roughly a petabyte a day. So you know, it's going to have a lot of sad teenagers, but it's a good way to you know, visualize what you're talking about. When we get to the SKA, then that's what I call big data. So 
an exabyte a day. That's how much data we're going to generate in about 2023. And um, yeah, what the heck is an exabyte? It's a lot of data. So that's an exabyte. And following my blending approach earlier, if you take Constantiaberg, which is this mountain over there somewhere, roughly, that side, you take that, pop it in your blender, blend it up, take each grain of that fine sand that you left over with, tag it with a bit, that's how much data we generate per day. So, you know, it really is properly a mountain of data that we have to deal with <laughs> and do something useful with because, you know, ultimately we want to get some science out of this stuff, so we can't just generate and do nothing with it. It gets even worse, though, because big data comes along with big energy. If we do the calculations and look to see what the costs are of moving this data around and particularly moving it from far afield places. So, you know, the square kilometer array will have stations as far, as I said, Mauritius, Madagascar, Kenya, Ghana, Mozambique. Bringing all that data back, I did the calculations last night, we're gonna spend 16 megawatts just on moving the bits to get them back here, back to the Karoo. So forget anything else, you've already spent 16 megawatts doing this, so you need a power station just to move your data around. So, you know, all these big, nice words and big problems come with all sorts of big ancillary problems. So, how do we build these kind of things? Um, so, yeah, I'll finally talk a little bit more about computers. I'll talk about some hardware first, and then a bit of software evangelism and, and tie it up that way. We need big iron, and uh, you know, sadly, we're not going to buy our own bucket excavator. Though I wish we could, because I mean, that, you know, who wants the right software when you could drive that thing every day? You know? <laughs> you know? That's really what we should all be aspiring to. It's like, ah, yeah. You know, that guy has proper job satisfaction when he wakes up in the morning. <laughs> so we need sort of, we need big iron of, of this kind of, this kind of ilk. So a modern radio telescope is really a big, giant, software-defined radio type thing. All we, the, the front end is very small and very simple, and we digitize as soon as we can. And we need to do a couple of major steps. Um, one of those is correlation. And correlation basically means you take the sampled signal from every antenna pair, and you cross multiply it and you accumulate it to some length. So obviously that problem scales squarely with the number of antennas. The other thing you need to do then is take all that vast amount of raw data and turn it into something useful, like an image of the sky. Now that might still be too big, so what you want to do is look through that image and extract sources from that. So specific galaxies and stars, you want to catalog them and produce a, a nice scientific paper at the end. So really, you know, it's data in here and like Nobel Prize is out the end of this side. That's the pipeline. <laughs> So the numbers also get a bit worrying here. I mean, you know, everything's just bloody exa. You know, there's exa flops there and maybe an exa mac. There's two to five exa flops there. So we've got exa bytes of data, exa flops of compute to put in there. You know, if you look at the DARPA challenge, which wants to get an exa flop in 20 megawatts of power by 2018, that's looking unlikely that they'll get there. They might get there by 2019 or so. That's still not really going to help us too much because that machine will be over our power budget by a factor of four, it'll be over our cost budget by a factor of about seven. So, you know, we're really going to have to think of new and interesting ways to do stuff here. Um, so, just to break it into a few segments, so the correlation problem, as I said, basically squares with the, the number of antennas. It's very parallel and it's very, very simple. It's basically just multiply accumulates and, and a heck of a lot of them. So, at the moment, our solution for this problem is to use FPGAs. Um, this is known as a roach board. Uh, it's a joint development between ourselves and the University of Berkeley under the, the banner of the CASPER collaboration. And uh, essentially, it's a general purpose signal processing board. There's a Vertex 6 FPGA under there um, and a bunch of mezzanine cards which give you a lot of connectivity and I.O. into this. So this board can do between 80 and 100 gigabytes a second um, with the data if you fully populate it, so you know, 800 gigabits a second. Um, but it can't do much with that. So, you know, it's very simple, small, easy operations that get done. Um, this is what we built for our CAT7 correlator. So it's, it's the previous version of these, actually using Vertex 5s, but we're using it as a test bed. And one of the interesting things you need to do is you need to transpose your data. So your data comes in and it's ordered by antenna. You need to transpose it and order it by frequency. And uh, that sounds pretty simple, and it is simple if you've got, you know, a gigabit a second, but if you've got an exabyte, it's, it, things are troublesome. So what we, what we do for that is we use a switch in the middle and we use you know, the natural routing of the switch to do the transpose. The downside of that is that we need you know, a lot of ports. So we're gonna need six to 10,000 ports of 40 to 100 gigabit ethernet um, when we come along. So it'll be, I think maybe Amazon can give us one of those. <laughs> Probably. If buy one, get one free. <laughs> but, that's it. But is it free shipping? That's the question. <laughs> that's what we want to know. 
<laughs> exactly. So we're very much experimenting with, uh, with plus networks to see if we can build a switch out of lots of smaller ones um, and a variety of technologies. I think the FPGA route still looks pretty promising, though it is relatively power hungry compared to going the ASIC route. Uh, but we don't think we'll have scale for, to go truly in, into the ASIC design. We don't think we'll have enough, uh, you know, enough of a run to do that. Um, on the, the, the other side of the correlation, this is the frequency channelizer part, this is the cross correlation part. Uh, we're testing out, you know, for instance, the Intel Knights Ferry stuff, um, and certain GPUs as well look quite interesting there. Again, the power envelope is a bit of a problem. So we're playing with some solutions in that space. The next step along the line is imaging. So we want to take all this raw data and turn it into something that's like a pretty picture of the sky. Not here. Sorry, there we go. Yeah, good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and what's interesting about imaging is, as a supercomputing problem, it's quite hard because it has a very low Amdahl number. So basically that means that you need a relatively large number of bits of I.O. relative to your number of flops. You don't really want, to, it's not necessarily talking unity here, but we probably want something in the region of one bit of I.O. per 10 flops. And uh, if you look at modern supercomputing architectures, that's quite skewed. It's very skewed into lots and lots of flops, but your I.O. is not, is not that great. And uh, again, talking about the DARPA challenge, one of the, the problems we face there is that their projected Amdahl number is, a, is, a, is two orders of magnitude off what we need. So essentially, we'll just have lots and lots of flops sitting there burning power but not being able to do anything because we can't stream the data through it fast enough because our problem is relatively computationally sparse. So what we're playing around with that is one of the things that we've got busy going in our labs at the moment is a thing called Iron Hive. Basically, the idea there is to take a bunch of SOCs, um, so the things sitting in your cell phone. Uh, we're trying a range of them. We've uh, got Tegra 4s. We've got some kind of dark parts from Freescale, which I'm not allowed to talk about, and uh, Exynos 5s. Um, just to cover a bit of a range. But basically, you take a bunch of these, probably in the region of 2,000 of them, you package them quite tightly, and you put them in a mineral oil bath, and you close that thing, seal it up. You throw this thing in the Karoo, it uses about three kilowatts of power, which you can deliver via solar means, and you can cool it with a glycol ground loop, 25 meter borehole gives you free cooling. So it's kind of like this data center in a box you just throw in the field and forget about it. So it's looking quite promising. And as I say, these processes are quite well optimized for our task because they're relatively no number of flops uh, for the amount of I.O. you can get into it. Particularly this dark beastie here, this can do, this has got four 10 gig uh, links into it, and it's got two power PC cores, so its end dollar number is actually quite useful for us. Um, and of course, that's what you do with imaging, you do yeah, imaging science. The third leg of this thing is, uh, is, is time domain science. Here what you want to do is you just want to look at the raw data that's streaming out of the telescope to look for transient events. And uh, this is kind of one of the more exciting new aspects of radio astronomy is saying, you know, look look at the sky and wait for something to go bang, you know, and then go quickly back and, and look at the data and see what happened to it and try and reconstruct the event. And uh, this means we need very high, we have very high volumes of data, we need to store it because we need to work through it and, uh, and try and process it to tease out these little uh, transient events. And um, you can tell that Intel gave me all this hardware for free because there's Intel logos everywhere. Um, but essentially we wanted to see how, how we could use commodity hardware, which is particularly optimized for streaming throughput. Um, to make these very low cost boxes. And uh, this box here can do 20 gigabits a second uh, through the G GPU. It has two one rooms after this picture. Uh, through the GPU, does a lot of processing the GPU and then dumps it out onto SSDs and, uh, and writes us at wire speed. And it keeps up with the 20 gigabits a second quite happily, of course, even with eight SSDs, it only gives us like half an hour of storage and can fill up the storage. So, you know, and then what do we do with the data? We've got nowhere else to put it, so we just delete it and you know, continue on. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's interesting to me that sort of, you know, sort of the Xeon product line, if you take the, the server-focused stuff, their streaming throughput is actually quite poor. You know, they're very optimized for IOPS and not so much for streaming, but the enthusiast stuff, the gaming stuff, is actually really, really good for the, the streaming tasks that we do and way cheaper, especially if you build it yourself. This is what you do with the, the, the transient science is you look at particularly pulsars. So um, this shows you a, a pulsar return. So a pulsar is, an, is, a, is a rapidly rotating neutron star. You take a big star, if it's not quite big enough, it's like a little engine that could, if it's kind of seven solar masses or seven times our, our sun, it burns out its nuclear field, it collapses in on itself, and it doesn't quite collapse to a big uh, black hole, it ends up as a neutron star. So this is neutron degenerate matter. Um, to give you a feel for neutron degenerate matter, if you have a teaspoonful of that, that basically weighs the same as all the people on the planet. So if you take all the people on the planet, you mash it into a teaspoon, that's now you've created neutron degenerate matter. So it's probably a thought experiment more than anything else, but it, it's interesting. <laughs> um, and so these things spin rapidly out in space there, and they give us, they, 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 
when they're spinning, the, the rotational axis is not quite aligned with the, the relativistic jet axis. So you get this jet of, of the jet of matter coming out, and any time you have relativistic electrons, you get radio emission from them through synchrotron emission, and we can observe this as kind of a lighthouse effect. And because they're so dense and they're spinning so fast, they're really, really stable, so they make really excellent clocks. This is a, a, you know, one of the really interesting things that you can study uh, you know, with, with radio telescopes. Big storage, of course. Yeah, so Meerkat is, again, relatively modest. 10 petabytes or so will be our, our archive um, for that, for the first maybe two years of operation. Uh, SK will need at least an exabyte um, worth of storage. Again, if you do the cost numbers, you know. So I'm old, so I like tape. So, you know, I'm going to have a whole lot of tape in this thing. Um, and it's like, oh, no, tape. Ah, but, you know, if you don't have to pay for any, any watts for your bits to be spinning around in, in, in space, it's, uh, that's awesome. So we, uh, we have probably 75% of, of our storage with it at least will be tape. So onto software a little bit. So big software, of course. I mean, if you're gonna write a big software, it must be COBOL. 200 billion lines of COBOL can't be wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's, it's an interesting number that, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of COBOL out there, so you know, I keep, uh, keep a suspicious eye on what it's doing. But <laughs> obviously it's no good having just this, this big hardware there without, without good software to support it, and particularly you know, writing software that scales well and writing software that doesn't end up costing you so much more to write it than, it, you know, it's actually giving you productive output. And, uh, you know, too often I think, we, you know, people look at the budget of a project and you'll say, right, okay, this project is 10 times bigger than that project in terms of money, so I need 10 times more people. And, of course, you know, we all know that that's pretty much a recipe for disaster. So, David Beasley is my favorite quote of all time. So, David Beasley is the guy who wrote SWIG, uh, which is the Python C++ binding. He was a big C++ evangelist. And eventually he got too old and he just retired from C++ and said life was too short, so he wrote a whole lot of other things. And um, if you couple that with some of our philosophy, uh, which we kind of have internally, which is deliver only what is needed, it's a very obvious statement, but it gets lost a lot of times. Um, in my opinion, scale is better ideas, not more code, but uh, you know, that still bears thinking about. Simple is better than complex. Optimize last is you know, one of my favorite mantras to say is that as soon as you start off a project by saying I must optimize at the beginning, something's gone a bit wrong somewhere. And uh, you know, you may find yourself in a situation that there are examples of kind of very short-lived, very targeted things where you have to optimize right at the beginning. You know you're going to have to. But in general, what turns out is that those optimizations you made really, really early on, you tend to throw them away. And they're very expensive. They cost you a lot of development time to get to. And often you'll start going along thinking, oh, I need to optimize tomorrow, and then you know, there's a bigger server available or someone's written a better framework for you or something like that. And you can leverage that rather than spending a lot of time yourself, you know, in the dungeon writing assembler. Of course, that's not very manly, you know. Oh, you know, I must be a proper coder. But, um, you know, getting the job done, I think, is quite important. And, you know, perfection is an illusion is another good one. It, it really is. You can try as hard as you like, but, you know, perfection's not there. The thing must work. Get the job done. That kind of mantra. So all this, of course, leads you to Python as a language. So here, I begin my Python evangelist session, those of you who don't like to fall asleep, um, by saying, of course, Python is slow. Oh, no, you know, regex DNA, ah, it's 4.4 times slow. This is crappy. You know, Laplace solver, look at that, 6,500 times slow. What are you doing? What kind of a horrible language is this? Suck it, Python. You know, go away. <laughs> of course, the answer to that is you're just holding it wrong. <laughs> yeah? So... So what you need to do is think, how am I using my language to its best ability? So instead of doing something that's totally serial, of course, you should at least vectorize it. So you know, that's a lot faster and it's quite a lot closer to C. I always have the next slide prepared because you know, people will say, but it's just C underneath. And I know, of course it's C underneath, but I didn't have to write any C, which is great. You know, someone else wrote it for me and we're reusing someone else's efforts, which I think is you know, really useful. So it's about making best use of the tools you have available, not particularly being you know, tied to a specific thing. But you know, we're still slower than C, and is that because it's Python, or is it because of the interpreter and the client? So my statement, my contentious statement, is it's C Python, it's to blame not Python itself as a language. And I think it, in, in many ways that's true of most languages, that it's not the language fundamentals so much. Obviously some are better for problems than others, but you know, there's a lot to be said for thinking about how do you go about taking language and getting it into the machine into the tin that you're trying to run it on. So that's basically your CPU most of the time. It's just sitting there, it's doing nothing. You know, especially cell phone CPUs, they're just doing nothing all the time. What we want to do 
is make the CPU work. So our case, particularly, is this thing called gridding, where we want to take uh, our very random visibilities. These are the data that come out of the telescope. They're randomly, they're not uh, regularly gridded, so they're randomly spaced. And we need to regularize that grid so we can F of T it. And we do that through a convolution process, and that's quite expensive. So our metric for that is kind of one nanosecond per point. But to do that, we have to get 64 gigabits a second into an eight-core CPU, which you know, is kind of an order of magnitude more than what we actually have in reality by the time you've gone through all the hoops and loops of getting that data into the thing. So there's my contention. Another contentious contention. There's a lot of those today. But basically, what I'm saying is that you can get away, you can sacrifice some CPU performance if other things can balance that out so you're not wasting time. And you know, it depends on the exact problem. But I'll show you a bit about why that is. So this is a boring slide. Or, or, you know, basically, we just made a big, a big file that we were storing. We store our data in HDF5 format. And it was quite slow, and we we're trying to figure out why. So we spent a lot of time playing with it. Uh, here's a bit more about the tests. Um, Interestingly, none of our original optimizations were optimal. So again, that's this optimized first, last conundrum that we spent time optimizing and they're all just rubbish, really. Um, what we did find is this, which is interesting, is this shows you the net read speed for this data. And the blue graph is reading it into C, into, into you know, a decent memory structure in C. And the green is reading that same data and it ending up in an NumPy array in Python. And of course, this is a bit curious because the green is bigger than the blue. And uh, what we're seeing here is the, the at work is, we, is a technology called BLOSC, uh, which is kind of a, a cache size, just in time decompression algorithm, which works actually really well. Uh, it chows a bit of CPU, which is why at the high end this thing doesn't scale. But essentially what we're saying here is that by choosing Python instead of choosing C, we're not sacrificing any performance. In fact, we're gaining some performance in the specific case that we're talking about. So our contention is, you know, the IO is pretty good. So how do we fix the CPU performance side so we're not 10 times slow, we can afford to be maybe one time slow. Uh, Python, there's lots of cool stuff. Uh, what's interesting about Python is that there's lots of money in it through these guys because the financial trading guys like Python because they have to rewrite their algorithms every two months because it's basically bots fighting bots and when the one bot figures out what the other bot's doing then they need a new bot and then they write an obfuscating bot to try and trick the other bot into doing something stupid and then billions of dollars just disappear in a fraction and anyway, the bottom line is you've got to write your code really, really quickly to keep up with everyone else. So there's quite a lot of activity in the financial space around Python, which is good for us because we don't have any money, but they've got lots, and so cool things are happening. Um, so just a little, a few more little examples, a little toy example, a little Mandelbrot, Python 14 seconds, C 0.25, you know, that's pretty crappy. Um, there's lots of cool things you can do. So you can write C extensions, of course you're writing your own C then, but it's easy to integrate and it's pretty fast. Um, you can do things like, you know, some, some just-in-time compiling, and I'll talk a little bit more about LLVM. But basically, this is a, a, a kind of a, a sly wrapper around the LLVM intermediate code that gets generated, which means you don't have to do any, any, any worrying, really, about typing and issues such as that. Um, so this is really what I wanted to talk about a bit. So I find it quite interesting that the growth of LLVM over the last four years. So LLVM is basically, um, it started out together with Clang as a replacement for GCC, because GCC was particularly to optimize GCC further was getting quite tricky, and people were finding it really hard to put in your own optimization. So um, LLVM as a project came along and basically said, well, let's work on an intermediate representation that is good for a whole lot of use cases. And this is what IR looks like. This is LLVM intermediate representation bit code. And essentially, this is a bridge between your language and your hardware to some extent. So Clang, for example, is optimized for taking C and turning it into LLVM bit code. And then there are back-end targeters that take LLVM bit code and make it into x86 ASM, which is you know, not far off this stuff, you know, as you can see. But the point is there that the guys who are writing compilers can just concentrate on, on a single you know, targeted, well-optimizable and well-parallelizable uh, intermediate representation bit code. So it makes the front-end language a bit less important and it leaves the hardware optimizer guys free to optimize this stuff. So as an interesting example, you know, those of you who know this will actually know that this is a cheat. You can, you can call me on it afterwards. But roughly speaking, some Python code and some C code turn into the same intermediate representation. So already that's telling you something about how this whole thing is working and where it's actually going. So LLVM, you know, it, what's nice about once you've got this bit code is you can do a whole lot of things. You can target a whole lot of architecture. So you know, there's machine code. You can go to PTX. Uh, so CUDA have switched their compiler to use LLVM internally. So once you have decent intermediate representation bit code, getting it to run on GPU, 
not optimally for sure, but getting it to run at least run is pretty easy, and the optimizers are not the optimization is not that hard. Uh, you can go to OpenCL, you can actually go to JavaScript if you want. So you know you can just take your IR and you can run it in your browser. Um, you can go from Python to Python use via IR, which gets really hairy, and you can like, all these cool like you know Google Translate loops of things where you go from 500 languages and see if you end up with the same thing. Um, but I, I think what you know what this is kind of taking us to is a is an era where you don't have to worry so much about your choice of language in terms of performance and you know worry about how's it going to work on a particular piece of hardware. It's more about saying I need to pick a language that has the right kind of data structures for my problem. It's easy for me to, to use. I understand it. All those kind of more more you know sort of softer side of things. Um, a little plug for PyPy. Uh, you know the, this is kind of you know Python's just-in-time compiler strategy, and uh, you know that works pretty well. Um, and I think you know, they rejected LLVM quite early on, but I think you know, there'll be a merge back in that you know, sometime in the future because there's, there's definitely good ideas on both sides of that. But basically, you know, my sort of take home is that for us, our biggest cost is actually development. Um, we did a GPU project about two years ago, which was, which was pretty big. I mean, we had you know, sort of 20 machines with you know, four GPUs in each. The cost of the hardware was only one third the cost of the software um, to develop this thing because it was really hard. And so, if you can save that money by, you know, working in a high-level language, it's much easier to get the stuff onto the, you know, onto the road. I think that, uh, you know, can save you a lot. And, you know, there's, there's tools and tricks you can use to, to make sure that your performance is good. So, um, that's the end of my Python evangelism session. So people can wake up again. <coughs> Closure, excellent. Right. Um, so, we've also got one of the other things we're doing with, with sort of big software is. Processing this, this data that we get in from the radio telescope is quite challenging in that there are a lot of tweakable parameters that go into it. And typically what would happen is you would record this raw data from a telescope, you would throw it onto disk and you would sit there, or you would get your grad student to sit there, beavering away for two months, trying every possible parameter. And that's fine if your data file is two gigabytes big, but it's no good when it's two petabytes big. Uh, though maybe in 2035 or something. But you know, in the timescales we're talking, it's still going to be a bit of a problem. So, We're spending quite a lot of time, particularly with IBM, the Watson guys, uh, figuring out good ways to build machine intelligence to tweak these parameters. And uh, we're starting with some, you know, some easy cases where we just look for, for bits of bad data that you otherwise wouldn't be able to find um, by eye just because it's going through so fast uh, and tagging those off. But you know, we hope to get to the stage where kind of the black belt astronomer effectively you know, becomes obsolete because the machine is doing it all for them. Maybe that's not good for me. It probably isn't, but uh, you know, at least it will save us some some time in the long run. You know, I think the sort of community side of these big software things is also important. Uh, you know, I, I very much enjoyed a lot of the talks you know that have been had over the last two days. It's you know, I come from an environment where we are continuously dealing with with the big vendors and you know these sort of uh, you know, captains of industry, and it's very refreshing to come to a more you know kind of a more open environment where people are talking about just exciting tools to get the job done, rather than like how can we absolutely maximize profit. So, you know, we try as we can to give back to the community. Most of our stuff is open source on GitHub. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's free labor as well and a lot of the testing. So, you know, that, uh, that, that helps us as well. So just a, you know, just a, a bit of closing. So, talked about software and talked about hardware. Uh, you know, the, the people side of it is, is quite an important thing and the kind of African context is quite an important thing for this project as well because it's, it's not just, you know, it's not just another box or widget that you're building. Um, you know, it's. I started this in 2005, and it's really been amazing. How in 2005 you would go to, you know, some conference and say, "Ha, I'm a radio astronomer from Africa," and they'd be like, "What? You know, you lunatic? <laughs> you know, where'd this guy come from?" But um, you know, now if we go, over, you know, we go and we talk to people, and they're like, "Oh, yeah, yeah radio astronomy in Africa, yay!" And uh, it's, it's amazing how we've been able to change that, that dialogue in the last 10 years. And you know, a lot of that is through the effort of people. Um, we've got a relatively small team. We've, we've grown quite a bit. This is an older photo, because you can see there's Simon sitting there um, back in the day. But uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively compact team. We cover a lot of disciplines. But uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's worked well. It's, it's been a really like, kind of exciting, exciting, place to, exciting place to work. And we've also tried hard to grow the human capital around the project. So we haven't just used it you know, to build cool technology, we're also building, hopefully using it to build cool people. And uh, you know, our bursary conference started off uh, when we had, in 2007 or so, you know, we had 30 people. Now this is the last year's bursary conference. Uh, so we've got this massive bursary program with lots of people coming through. So if anyone's interested in, in kind of science and engineering looking for bursaries, I know there's not really many students here, but you know, 
speak to us. There's lots of positions in postdocs and, 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 and so on that, uh, that you know, if you're interested in getting involved, there's, there's the opportunity. Um, but also, you know, it's, it's cool to be able to go and talk to people about something that's quite inspirational. And uh, you know, this, this is the local school nearest to our site. This is about 80 kilometers away in Carnarvon. And uh, you know, this, this sort of thing was, they, this is this kind of stuff that they, you know, really captured the imagination. They said, no, no, we want to, we want to visualize this, you know, a spiral galaxy. Come and help us and we'll, we'll go and stand out in the field and, and make these things. And you know, the, the growth and interest in science and technology that's coming through, particularly in, in the rural areas of the Northern Cape and, and other parts, I think is, uh, you know, it's, 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 really, it's really cool. And it's, it's just you know, an exciting thing, an exciting thing that's happening. And finally, you know, it's sort of corny, but you know, it's a new dawn for African science. It's, uh, it's kind of closing the loop on, on you know, thousands of years of history of, of doing, doing science on the continent of Africa. And uh, you know, we, we really look forward to the next uh, you know, 15 years and 20 years of building this thing and 50 years of operating it and uh, you know, sort of seeing where we end up. So you know, if you're interested at all, you know, have a look at our website. There's, there's lots of cool facts and figures there. And uh, you know, we'd love to chat to people, especially you know, this, I've seen some really cool ideas and lots of interesting things about scale. I'd love to chat to you about uh, you know, solutions to, to our problems and uh, yeah, there's things we can we can talk about. So yeah, with that, questions. Can you tell us the the, um, the mathematics behind the um, semi-random spacing of of those telescopes? Right. Um, so if you if you kind of look at them from you know a bird's eye view it looks like it's pretty randomized. And the reason we do that is because you don't want to have a lot of redundant baseline lengths. So if you look at it from above, and you could, you could imagine laying these telescopes out in kind of a straight line with 10 meters between each one of them, that means you'd have lots and lots and lots of 10 meter baselines. And effectively what you're doing um, with, your, with your telescope array is you're measuring the spatial Fourier transform of the sky distribution, and you're sampling it based on your projected baseline length. So if you've got a pair of antennas looking at a source, um, as that source moves through the sky, the projected baseline between them changes, and uh, that's the basis of interferometry. But essentially, if you have lots and lots of, uh, you know, if you have a lot of uniformity in your own, a lot of patterns, you just sample those same points again and again and again, and you overlay that data on top of each other. It doesn't give you a, you know, a new point. So you, you, effectively, what you do is you end up missing Fourier components in your measurement um, if you have this thing, uh, you know, completely completely regular, if it's completely, completely random, then things go astray as well, because then you might end up with something that has patterns in it, because something that's truly random tends to have a pattern in it, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Three people wanted to ask you that question. Oh, there we go, yeah. Uh, anyone else? That was the burning question, apparently. <laughs> So um, you, you're ter generating petabytes of data. It, it's not only a big data problem for you, but also for like the universities and other institutions that want to work with this data. Presumably, they also need to not only transfer this data, but store it to analyze it. Um, so what I'm really asking is, like, how feasible is it for there to be, like, I think the number is approximately 400 institutions that are going to get this data first, like for them to all have a copy of it. Right, it's a good question. I, you know, I mean, I think the reality of the situation is that people have got to learn to let go of their data. You know, there's no way it's feasible or practical for us to send, you know, multi-petabyte files to people around the world because for them to, you know, interpret it and look at it, they'll have to have a pretty massive computer themselves. And so, you know, the model is very much kind of a service observatory where you say, I want to observe this piece of sky, and we come back to you and say, here's an image or here's a catalog. And you kind of have to trust us that, uh, you know, we're getting to that level. But even then, you know, the images we're talking about, as I say, will still be pretty massive. And uh, we've got a bit of a campaign at the moment where we're looking to see, can we grow, particularly in the South African universities, can we grow these kind of regional centers um, that will specialize in a particular aspect of, of, of the data processing, the kind of tertiary data processing. And, uh, and ship it out to there. You know, we're not really following the CERN model of you know, very quickly distributing data out to you know, regional, regional tiers, um, firstly because of the, the geopolitics behind what went into CERN, but also, again, it comes down to energy costs. It's not even the cost of the links, it's just the megawatts needed to distribute this data. It's just 
you know, you go to Eskom and say, you know, ah, we'll need another 100 megawatts, and they're like, yeah, no problem, 2065 or something, you know. <laughs> so um, we've got to be we've got to be as careful as we can with that. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. No more questions. Yeah, Pierre's um, calling everyone. Eh? Yes. I thought that this different type of scale would be a really good way to end the conference, and I think I was right. So thank you so much. That was brilliant. Sure.